to mobilize capital and, and do partnerships with folks on the ground. So maybe, Agnes, you can talk a little bit about what that evolution has looked like at USAID. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. So I think um, the reason USAID and other donors have really started moving into space is kind of in this space is threefold. First, um, we've noticed that there's actually a lot of interest from private investors to uh, invest in some of the emerging markets and some of the developing countries where we actively work and have been working for 50 years. Uh, second, there's actually a lot of private capital that is already flowing to these markets. And this is also, this is not just because of this interest, but it's also because these countries, the emerging markets and the developing countries where we work, actually are demanding more investments and need more investment to come in. So they're not just depending and asking for aid they're asking for private investments. And third, uh, we really recognize that this is a great opportunity for donors to leverage some of that interest and some of that capital. And I should mention that that capital also brings skills and uh, knowledge with it. It's not just about the money. Um, to really leverage all of those resources towards the sectors where we work, such as agriculture, health, and education, and to try to really expand the pie of resources available for those countries and for those sectors to grow and to really achieve scale. Um, what kind of resources do we offer and what are we trying to leverage? So really we have a couple of uh, types of resources that I think are useful to investors. First, we obviously deploy grants. Second, we offer guarantees, which Eleanor will talk about in a second. Third, we have a network in over 80 countries of local actors who we have been working with, as I mentioned, for 50 years. So we have a great local presence, and we're often seen as a transparent broker um, who can really introduce private sector to and investors to the developing countries and to entrepreneurs and organizations, local organizations that are working there. And last, we do have uh, substantial convening power. So we are able to bring in not just the local actors, like I mentioned, but also other donors and other organizations who are working in these countries and in this space, which a lot of private sector investors found, find very beneficial, uh, mainly because it's difficult, as you can imagine, to really understand what's happening in Kenya. It's a lot easier if you can convene all the actors who are working in the sector of education and speak to them all at once. Um, so those are the four resources that we're really trying to leverage. Um, grants, network, guarantees, and the convening power. And I'm actually really excited to share the stage uh, with the others here because they will give you examples of exactly how USAID and other donors are trying to leverage those resources because we're working with all of them. So I'll just turn it to them at this point. Yeah, I think maybe we'll start, keep it in, inside USAID for a minute <laughs> and come to Eleanor. But I think, for, I, I see some familiar faces, so I think some of the folks here are probably familiar with the Development Credit Authority and the guarantee power that USAID has, but some may not be. So maybe you can, Eleanor, just share a little bit about what DCA is doing. I, I used to manage the impact investment portfolio at J.P. Morgan Chase and was an early recipient of some of the creative work that you all are doing, so I'd love to hear about sort of how that's evolved and, mm -hmm. and how you're using that tool to accomplish some of the partnerships and collaboration that Agnes referenced. Yeah, great. So thank you, Amy, for the introduction. And Agnes set me up very well because she ran through sort of the menu of interventions that we have in moving the aid community towards investment. Um, one of the very specific tools we have is offered by my office at USAID, the Development Credit Authority. I think when most people think of USAID, they think of us as the um, government's aid agency. We do do this. We have one commercial tool um, in my mind, which is the loan guarantee tool. So we don't do direct debt investments, we don't do equity investments, but we have the guarantee tool, which we use to partner with private financial institutions to share the risk on um, private debt investments into sectors that we are supporting otherwise through our technical assistance. Um, so we in DCA, we like to think that we've been moving from aid to investment since 1999 um, when we gained as the, as the agency the authority to issue these guarantees. Um, since 1999, we've built up a portfolio of 5.4 billion in commitments, out of which we've actually leveraged 1.9 billion in loans. So just to, we, we us I usually have a nice visual to explain this, but um, 
if you can picture in your mind a private lender, um, that lender can be a local bank, it can be an international bank, it can be a microfinance institution. And as Amy referenced, we are evolving and, and probably piloted it with Amy through our, um, our deal with JP Morgan lending into a fund, so guaranteeing a loan into a fund. Um, so we're partnering with these private lenders to share the risk 50-50 on a peri passu basis for loans to either a single borrower or a portfolio of borrowers, um, like I mentioned, in sectors that we support through our technical assistance, uh, be it agriculture, education, more and more, uh, we're looking at renewable energy, um, et cetera. So we, since 1999, we, um, we have really evolved as a guarantor. Um, so like I said, really focusing originally on local currency, local financial institutions, but more and more, and one reason I'm here this week is we are working with non-traditional debt providers. Um, and I would say in the example with Amy, I think actually the borrower was a little more tra uh, non-traditional for us. It was the Af uh, African Agriculture um, Capital Fund, and it was a fund that was raising both commercial debt through J.P. Morgan, but also some grant funds. We used the guarantee to pull in J.P. Morgan's uh, commercial debt, um, which was used to catalyze the additional uh, grant funds from, from Rockefeller, from Gates. Um, to, uh, for the fund to online to agribusinesses across East Africa. Um, really, how we think of it, and Amy can <laughs> confirm that the guarantee is really what got JP Morgan over the hump in terms of being willing to take that risk, and this is really where we see our value add. Um, the, the guarantee um, is a U.S. Treasury-backed guarantee. It's AAA rated. It's been very appealing for investors. Um, often to enter sectors and markets where they would never look otherwise. Um, so we, um, we have, you know, with our 1.9 billion in, in loans dispersed, we um, feel as if we have been very successful and look to continue that. Um, I could go on and on with examples, but maybe I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, no, for sure. I can remember just as a quick anecdote, like doing the credit analysis at JP Morgan when we did this transaction and they were like, oh, so half of this is exposed to East Africa to small enterprises in the agricultural sector. So it's like the most extreme, highest risk rating possible. But they're like, the other half is the U.S. government. This is great. We can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you only got 50% on the line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let me then, to come back, to come outside of USAID, um, so Gerhard and Jake are here really to represent the practitioner perspective, and I gave only brief intros, so you should feel free to provide some organi organizational context, excuse me, for this, but it'd be great to hear about some examples that you all have and the work that you've done with aid and, and other donor agencies to sort of do, sort of affect the development objectives that you have on the ground. Sure. Um, well, thanks very much for having me. Um, as a bit of background, so Cross Boundary is a frontier market investment advisory firm. We have about 30 investment professionals. We have three offices in Africa and offices in D.C. and New York. Um, you know, I think in terms of how we've been able to partner uh, with USAID to align private capital with development outcomes, I would put it into roughly sort of two categories. Um, the first category would be uh, working with USAID to solve risk mitigation problems or capital supply problems. Um, so as an example, about three years ago, we set up a small investment vehicle called Cross Boundary Energy to invest in rooftop solar for businesses in Africa on a PPA, a power purchase agreement, or long-term asset lease basis. Um, it was a new asset class. Um, you know, I think investors were a bit skittish about it. And as we structured that vehicle, USAID came in with a $1.3 million subordinated capital contribution, essentially meaning that it gets paid back second uh, to the private investors. And with that commitment, um, we were able to raise an additional $8 million of private capital for about a $10 million uh, investment vehicle, which is now almost fully deployed and we'll be out raising uh, the next vehicle uh, this winter. Um, so I think there was actually two benefits from, from that sort of interaction. One is the credibility that the involvement of USAID and the U.S. government brings uh, to a transaction. And the other, of course, is the sort of sweetener um, of that blended capital and slightly improving the investor's risk profile and the return. Um, so that's sort of in the risk mitigation category. The other category would be um, in the transaction uh, cost uh, challenge, the transaction cost challenges in these smaller and uh, shallower markets. Um, in new and markets, particularly in fragile states, you know, often the investment size um, is, is rather small and the transaction cost to set up structure and properly diligence that investment can outweigh, at least on a private basis, uh, the potential return. 
Um, so as an example, on the advisory side, we've partnered with USAID in Mali in West Africa, um, certainly a fragile state, to have a small team of advisors on the ground to help support investors coming into that market. Um, and that's been a successful program over the last two years, um, helping uh, directly facilitate over $30 million of private investment um, from a diverse set of investors, including uh, INP, which is a fund manager who I believe actually is here at SOCAP, IFC, um, Injaro, and a number of other regional private equity firms. So those are, I think, two examples of how USAID can help uh, address barriers on the capital supply side or in these sort of transaction cost issues that often can uh, sort of make it very difficult to undertake smaller and riskier transactions. Thank you, Amy. Um, Gerhard Priest with Serona Asset Management based in Toronto and Amsterdam. Um, I, I, even five years ago, I wouldn't have imagined myself sitting at, the, at a podium like this with, um, with public sector players. Um, I just, uh, for the last 20 years, I've been studiously focused on private uh, investors only, private capital markets only. And that was because about 20 years ago, I'd appealed to a number of sovereign development agencies to invest in developing countries, not grant. And I recall one, one situation where I was pretty much run out of town, um, aghast, the, these people aghast that uh, we would actually invest in, say, sub-Saharan Africa and expect capital return. I mean, that, you don't do that. You just donate to Africa. You don't, you don't invest there. Um, and that was, that was a response that we, we used to get. And, and so we, we studiously stayed away from public sector relationships for the longest time. But that changed about five years ago when I got a call from a, from a friend who said, you've got to come to Ottawa because the Canadian government's thinking new thoughts. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, he, he, I, he convinced me to allow him to speak to the Canadian government on our behalf. Um, and out of that came the beginning of, a, of relationships where we've actually doubled down in working with public private in a public private collaborative way um, with with a number of sovereign sovereign development in institutions and um, um, DFIs etc so just for uh, to answer your question Amy um, for example we did strike a relationship with the Canadian government where they invested um, in one of our funds they put in 15 million which um, to uh, to mitigate they put in for 15 million million in a fund as a first in last out basis and that catalyzed um, about um, eight times that from private capital investors who thought oh my now the risk adjusted rate of return relationship looks pretty attractive so that that was one of them another one was where we simply acted as a conduit for some USAID funding to SMEs in Southeast Asia to innovate uh, in the field of women's empowerment. So these are investing companies of ours in Southeast Asia, and an RFP went out, come up with innovations, innovations that empower women to uh, advance in your business. And so uh, without, without just prescribing what that should look like, and forward came all these proposals, and based on, based on those proposals, if your proposal had a cost, a ticket of 100,000, you know, we'd throw in 50, or the AID uh, program would throw in 50 as a, as a, as a shot in the arm to, to help you do it, and then we disseminate the results of that uh, throughout our portfolio companies around the world. Um, so re really cool stuff. And then finally, one other nod to AID here, um, who, which has grown in, in, in my estimate, in, in, the, in, in my respect, a whole lot over the last few years. Um, the, we've, we've partnered with AID to explore um, one, of the, one of the main bottlenecks to the flow of private capital to developing countries, and that's FX risk. The capital markets haven't done a really good job of figuring out how to mitigate the FX risk, the foreign exchange risk. When you invest, wherever you're based, you invest in another country, you want to take that capital back home um, eventually or soon. In any case, you've, you're exposed to foreign exchange risk. And if you're a pension fund with, with liabilities, you've got to be paying your pensioners over the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. You don't want to take on too much uh, foreign exchange risk. Um, the capital markets haven't done a good job of dealing with that. And particularly, I mean, I, our investors, we uh, feel it. 
uh, since it, it, it goes in big ways, but in t June 2014, when the oil price collapsed, um, the US dollar began to spike and uh, financial returns, Americans investing in other markets around the world got gutted. The, the US dollar rose, the investments may have been performing well in those local currencies, but of course the returns got gutted. Um, and PEA has done some market studies and found that that foreign exchange risk is the second highest rated risks. That's why LPs stay on the sidelines and don't invest in emerging markets. And so we're working with AID to, to innovate on the, uh, uh, in the field of foreign exchange risk mitigation. Can, are there firms out there in the world involved in uh, global risk management, involved in, in hedging, involved in FX risk management of some sort? Are, are, uh, to those firms out there, are there ways that you could think of that you could help design new products, new strategies to mitigate FX risk? And so we're about halfway down the road on that project. And there's, quite frankly, there's some really cool innovations coming forward um, that the market just hasn't developed yet. And so thanks to a relationship, a partnership with, with USAID, we hope to be able to come to market in the next uh, year or so with some, some interesting new foreign exchange risk mitigation tools. Great. So I think Jake and Gerhard, in sort of reflecting on some of the examples that you mentioned, you both mentioned themes around risk mitigation, tr reducing transaction costs, and things that feel like where donor intervention has been particularly helpful, and you were gracious enough to reference the partnerships with USAID as well as part of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just to, take, to take, a, take a step back from the specifics, I wondered if you could sort of comment a little bit about, you know, what are those thematics where donor intervention is particularly helpful, knowing that there are limits to what donor agencies like USAID can do and the types of capital they can provide. They've actually got, you know, got incredible resources on the ground um, and experience in the markets that you all are trying to, to work with, which have their own challenges, as, as both of you have referenced. And I know, Jake, you were in particular going into conflict areas and post-conflict areas and trying to help be part of the rebuild story. So what are some of the programs or interventions that you think are most helpful or, and, and what would you like to see from a partner like USA to make those partnerships more effective? Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, I think a lot of what Agnes and her team uh, have been doing is, you know, to use a San Francisco word, disrupt the uh, traditional development model to some extent. I think there are challenges with the traditional development model as it's uh, been executed. There's high barriers to entry to working with, traditionally at least, to working with uh, USAID and other donor agencies, um, a lot of bureaucratic requirements that have built up over the years that make it difficult for new partners, you know, particularly ones that are primarily private sector oriented, that want to partner with the development community for just one opportunity, but that's not their core line of business, um, to understand and interface with uh, those institutions. As an example, you know, when we first structured that subordinated capital facility, it took us two years and a lot of lawyers. Um, I think now that that model is established, it will be much easier to deploy in the future. Um, so I think, you know, in innovation in that way is, is one improvement that we're seeing from USAID. I think another category is, you know, traditional development sort of did five-year plans. So you sort of came in um, to a given country and said, here's our five-year vision and we're basically going to uh, fixate on these certain outcomes and, you know, this sort of spending to achieve those outcomes over five years. And so it wasn't particularly adaptable and it couldn't move at sort of the speed and nimbleness of private capital. And so how do you make it uh, not only easier for new partners to interface, but for you know, priorities to shift and adapt and structures to shift and adapt on a much, much shorter time horizon so that you can do you know, a two-month intervention or a three-month intervention that enables a particular transaction um, instead of always you know, shooting for these very grand, ambitious, you know, countrywide plans? Um, I would say that it's, it's all about risk-adjusted rate of return. Um, it does come down to that. Uh, we've been working with, with African, um, health, m African ministers of health um, who are looking for private capital investment into the healthcare sector, the health sector in, in, in their countries. And Africa has 15% of the uh, global population, a higher percentage of the global disease burden, yet of private capital investment in healthcare, one-tenth of one percent lands in Africa. It, it's, it's crazy. Um, there are $250 trillion of capital in the markets. All of that, all of it would go to African health if that presented the, the best risk-adjusted rate of return. It doesn't, but it's not rocket science to solve. 
Um, not that we will have 250 trillion there. Um, but it's not rocket science to solve. And it is, it is about the risk-adjusted rate of return. And there, there are ways that, that one can, Jake mentioned, uh, mentioned a couple ways that one can tweak that risk-adjusted rate of return of, of an investment target um, through, through, through structuring, through um, blended capital. Um, so, uh, we talked about FX risk, for example. There are ways of adjusting that risk-adjusted rate of return. Joan Larea, I just see you there. Uh, <laughs> convergence is all about blending public and private capital to tweak that risk-adjusted rate of return to draw in and catalyze private capital into those markets. And so that's, that's what I would say would be, that's, that's the biggest pain point for sure. private investors. Yeah, I love African health, but goodness, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose my money. Yeah. So. Could I just, just to, to add slightly to that? You know, I think there are situations where there's a good available, there's a good opportunity that has the right risk-adjusted rate of return, but the investors and the capital are not aware of it or they don't have the right okay. capital channel to access that opportunity. And so I think part of, you know, where USAID and the network basically of intermediaries and advisories can help is economizing on essentially those search costs um, yeah. Because as a, you know, a single investor, perhaps based in San Francisco, you might have the theoretical appetite to invest in health in Uganda, but your sort of initial cost just to understand that landscape and find the opportunity might not be there. And that's where sort of blended finance can play a role to provide a vehicle yeah. such that those investors can access the opportunities. Yeah, so, I, so it's hopefully obvious to those of you in the audience, even though we don't spend time together on a stage like this very often, there's been a lot of conversation. And I think, um, I, I think a lot of the work that Eleanor referenced in terms of the buildup that's happened in DCA is sort of one example of what's been happening at USAID is, is a great representation of sort of trying to pick out some of these learnings from the different things that have happened on the ground and figure out what are the models that really result in the most effective partnerships. and. There is now, I'm going to leave it to Agnes to sort of explain this, but sort of a real interest in trying to launch and design a platform that will capture a lot of the learnings that these, these, these folks have talked about um, and really help to um, accelerate the interest in the number of transactions that are happening with this concept of blended finance, of using donor money in a more effective way to mobilize private capital. So do you want to give a, a preview for the audience of what you all are thinking about? Sure. I mean, as, as you've mentioned, you know, we feel that blended finance and, and blended capital solutions are really powerful and it's a really powerful development tool that we are trying to innovate around we really are trying to be better at reaching out to those who are already deploying it who are coming up with new innovative solutions of how to deploy it mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not easy as we mentioned <laughs> but we've managed to overcome a lot of obstacles and um, I'm really happy to to announce that we recently launched a platform which is called invest which will hopefully enable uh, all of you to work with us in a much more efficient and effective way. We did form a uh, very small core of partners just to start it. It's, it's really a startup within government. It's, a, it's an innovative way of, of working with others. And, and uh, the core partners are actually some of whom are represented right here. It's Cross Foundry, it's Tideline. We also have Convergence and the AI who are in the audience. Um, and this is a platform which we hope we can use to really access not just the capital from investors, but really, as I mentioned, the knowledge, the skills, the innovative solutions that can be deployed in the sectors where we work. So even if you are not yet working in emerging markets, but are interested in working with us and looking at what you can do in emerging markets, I definitely encourage you to reach out to us because, and to the other partners, I should say, uh, because we are looking to expand that group, that small core group into a large network of partners that can provide the right kind of solutions at the right time to all of our programs overseas that are looking to catalyze investment capital to agriculture, to education, to health, uh, that are looking for helping investors mitigate risk, as we've mentioned, that are looking to lower transaction costs, help investors lower transaction costs, and that are helping to build awareness. I think that this is a really, really important aspect of getting more investment into those sectors, just building the awareness of the fact that there are investable opportunities in those sectors, there are private sector solutions, and that we can help, um, that donors can really help catalyze those solutions towards uh, scalable solutions that really have an amazing development impact 
that would be beyond what grant dollars can do on their own. So we are really trying to expand the pie, complement grant dollars with investment dollars, and really build a very strong network under this invest platform. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very happy that we were able to do this, and it was a great partnership. We engaged all of these organizations that I mentioned into creating of this platform. Uh, which is another kind of innovation. We did not just go out there and say, as USAID, this is what we need. We actually went out and figured out how do we work with the private sector, and we co-created this platform, and hopefully we'll be co-managing it with others. So I'm very, very excited by this yet another innovation. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I certainly, for speaking from, for myself for Tideline, I think something that's really exciting about this is the fact that it's trying to take advantage of Jake and Cross Boundary bring a really unique skill set and experience, and Gerhard and Serona, and you have DCA and Tideline and Convergence and DAI and others who've been involved um, in trying to bring all of those experiences together in a way that creates the platform that will do everything that you said as far as risk mitigation and reducing transaction costs, making it easier to work with USAID, which is also a really great um, innovation. So I'm so maybe just to come back to the rest of the panelists who've been sort of part of these conversations, and, and the work is ongoing, we should, I think, something to just emphasize here that this is a, a work in progress and sort of an evolving, as, as Agnes said, a startup. So this is expected to grow and evolve as we get more input from the market. But what do you all anticipate as far as some of the challenges to sort of implementing this and having it achieve some of the goals and, and what in your mind does success look like? Is it more transactions? Is it deeper partnerships with some of the folks that are already there? Like how, how do you all think about the opportunity? This, yeah, I have a comment on that. So I think one thing we're very lucky about in setting this up is that we have an in-house tool, which is the guarantee. So off the bat, we have sort of one, one player along the spectrum. Um, I think, you know, one thing we talked about earlier and Amy referenced and probably all of you in the room who've ever tried to interact with USAID, you know it's very hard. It's, we are a behemoth. We are highly decentralized. What is my entry point into USAID? Um, I think this is one very specific entry point for us. I think through the guarantee arm also it's a very specific entry point. Then it's hard to know just who to pick up the phone and call, um, but Agnes and I can help you out with that. For, in my opinion, success, is that people are picking up uh, the phone and knowing who to call. And I can say from, from you know, 18 years of experience with DCA, in my role, especially on the origination side of guarantees, we are pounding the pavement looking for good partners. I think that through a platform like this, partners will start to come. They'll be calling us up, at least that, that is my idea of success here. So hopefully many of you in this room can help us with that. Sure. sure. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to hear that uh, you're starting this new platform. This, this Maybe you'll be calling us now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will. And I, I, I'm a, I apologize for, you know, staying away for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> but, Understandable. But, but I, I got to say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a full, full believer now in this, in, 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 de in developing a new economy with public-private collaboration. So I'm, I'm fully, fully on board. And it's not just... USAID and other public sector moving in a direction to understand and support private capital. It's the other way around as well. I mean, the, right, the reason we're here, the reason there's 3,000 3, people at SOCAP is because the private sector is recognizing that it's not all about shareholder value. It's mm -hmm. about stakeholders. It's about creating a society and a, and, and, and a better world. And so thrilled that, um, that we're able to, to, to come together. One thing I would encourage, if, 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 if I may say so, um, in as much as you can, work together with, with, with the DFIs, with your DFI, with OPIC. Um, there, there may be ways that um, uh, USAID resources and OPIC capital can move together to more efficiently drive more private capital into the target field sectors, countries, etc. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would echo the, the excitement on the initiative and having had a similar, you know, experience, you know, first interacting with USAID in you know, Afghanistan almost a decade ago, and you know, really seeing a real change in how they look at and want to work with private investors and private capital, um, I think it's really exciting. I think you know, maybe two challenges uh, of the potential platform is I think one is just an education challenge. So I think right now uh, the collaboration, um, not just you know, with USAID and, and the private sector, but in this sector as a whole, um, is very personality driven. And there's a need um, for people to sort of build a common language because uh, you know, d d the development community comes into these um, 
challenges with a very different language than a private investor. And you know, sometimes people don't realize that they actually have the same shared outcomes in mind, but they're talking about it in very different terms. And you ha do have people in the development community who historically have thought of profit as a dirty word, as profit as something that should be avoided. Um, and so I think there's a need you know, to build that sort of network of champions that can help advocate and show um, the potential that these solutions have. Um, the other just, I think, you know, cautionary thing is you know, not everything um, is appropriate for a blended finance solution. You know, not every road should be a toll road. Um, and also, there's a need to be precise about the types of concessionary finance and the rates that are appropriate. And it can be very different, um, you know, situation to situation. I think there can be a tendency to fixate on leverage and say, oh, we put in one public dollar and we got, you know, 20 private dollars involved. Um, but that might be an irrelevant metric. It might be very easy to achieve that in South Africa. And in fact, that transaction would have happened anyway without any uh, development support. Um, and you might have a one-to-one -one ratio where you spend a dollar just to get one private dollar into something in Sierra Leone. And that can be you know, completely valuable and fully additional. So I think it's important that we you know, calibrate our language to not just sort of use blended finance as a loose term and just sort of thinking of it as um, you know, similar in every context, but you know, calibrated to the level of risk um, and the level of transaction cost for the given opportunity. So let me ask one more question and then we'll, we'll come to the audience. There's a great group of folks here and I'm sure you all have questions, so we'd love to hear sort of the things that you're thinking about and any of your response to this. But so I think one of the, the big goals of this, as it is for a lot of activity that's represented here at SOCAP, is mobilizing private capital. It's getting to those groups that are not here at this conference, may not even know that it exists, and thinking about how they can get engaged in this work and get involved in the emerging markets. So as you think about Invest as a platform, and I open this to any of you who want to add comment, what are some of the design elements or what are some of the features of this platform that you think would be most effective or could be more successful in happening? In ha in looking to achieve that goal of getting more private capital into the market. So I could, I could say a couple of words about that. First of all, I, I really do appreciate Jake's comment about, um, you know, it's not all about blended capital, right? I mean, in general, I feel that development is about expanding the pie. So mm. there, there is still a use for grants, there is a use for commercial investment, and then there is a use for blended capital. And I think that to the extent that we could use this platform, to really build the knowledge of what are the appropriate solutions at the appropriate time in the appropriate context and uh, create some sort of a roadmap uh, for, for example, for other donors to also use. Um, it would be incredibly catalytic to the entire industry to moving this industry further because right now uh, I feel a little bit it's uh, leading with the solution before you really understand the problem. Sure. So, uh, so for example, you know, here we're talking to a fund and immediately we start talking about a first loss, but maybe first loss is not what's most catalytic. Maybe what's most catalytic in that situation is a sidecar TA facility or it's a guarantee. And I think that um, forming ways and models that we can learn from and really uh, communicate to other donors of how to figure out where your resource is the most catalytic in the right context with the right partners mm -hmm. and publishing those tools and those approaches it would be would be incredibly um, helpful to scaling up this concept of, of donors supporting blended capital. So I'm hoping that in addition to, of course, catalyzing lots of transactions and lots of investment and lots of innovative solutions in the sectors I mentioned, I really do hope that this platform serves as a convening place, as a knowledge base to those kinds of approaches. Yeah, that's great. Anything that the rest of you want to add on that? I just encourage innovation. Um, and secondly, w collaboration, working with, with others. Um, uh, serving as a platform is great, um, but it only works if, if people are coming to that platform and if every sovereign development agency wants to be the platform, um, it's, it's probably not going to be highly efficient. So working together, collaborating with others is, is going to be critically important. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the, the speed element, which I think is you know, st structured into this new mechanism is really important. You know, again, our original experiences with USAID, um, you know, both on the, on the sort of structured investment vehicle and some of the advisory work was sort of you know, two years from that first conversation where you say, oh, this is really interesting, let's work together, to when it actually came to fruition, um, which you know, was a long time um, in, the, in the world of private investment. And I think you know, for a lot of private investors, they'll just move on to other opportunities. Um, 
and so that, that ability for the development community to understand that uh, the private sector is, is moving at a different pace and needs to be more nimble, I think will be critical for this. Sure. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, just a quick comment. I Please. would also like to say thank you, Jake, for just pointing out that blended finance is not always the solution. We remind ourselves that in the DCA office, guarantees are not always the solution. USAID is an agency full of highly technical uh, uh, professionals in terms of uh, public health experts, education experts. Um, I think probably, Agnes, you're up against the same thing. When we try to tell the story about private capital, they're like, what? Why would we try to bring private capital to the public health space? And often that is correct. That is still an area for grant financing. Um, so we, um, I think this is an opportunity for us to think always very carefully about the right, what the right intervention is, as you said, Agnes. Um, but then on the other hand, we have examples where absolutely we have something that should be funded through private capital, through a more sustainable intervention. Um, we recently guaranteed the Women's Livelihood Bond, which was um, put together by um, Impact Investment Exchange out of Singapore. It was listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. It, was, it raised funds for, um, for MFIs and impact enterprises across Southeast Asia. It's been very hard to explain to certain parts of the agency why accessing the capital markets was so critical in that context and why it was possible and why it's a good model. So I think that we, as we continue to do things like that, we will, we will be able to learn from them as an agency. And then I think another you asked before about success, what does success look like through sure. Invest, um, is just serving as a model for other um, donor agencies. Um, and, and likewise them for us and what they're doing. But I think through this, specifically serving as that model. Yeah, great. You know, we're working with the Canadians. <laughs> I will add that for contact information, because we've talked a lot about Invest. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I um, we have another panel to go to, but I'll leave my cards here. So first of all, please feel free to reach out to me. Second, you can reach out to any of the partners here, Tideline, Convergence, uh, Cross Boundary, and BAI. Bridget is here from BAI. So I'm gonna ask the people maybe to stand, including the USAID folks who are here, so you know who to approach and get their card if you're interested in finding out more. So here are the people. My cards will be here as well, but please reach out to them. And, uh, and we will be happy to, to put you in contact on how to become part of this network we're trying to build. Yeah, so I think we have a bit of time for questions. If anyone's got them, I see a hand. Oh, I don't even have to worry about this. You guys are awesome. <laughs> okay, so there is a mic. Uh, so we've got one here, a uh, very brave soul who went first, and then we'll try and catch as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Shanley, I'm with Connected. We're a USAID advisory firm. We help organizations to work with USAID. And I'm curious what your thoughts are with uh, the new administrator, Mark Green, in there, <laughs> how his priorities are, if he's already made some statements on this, or how his activities might, uh, might affect this space. So um, we haven't really been, uh, been given any new priorities. I mean, as a development agency, we're obviously continued the kind of work that we've been doing. Um, we are obviously supportive of, uh, of the priorities of the new administration, and we're looking really forward to starting work. I mean, he just joined a couple of months ago. Um, we have not, uh, and I think he's really been learning a lot. Uh, he did a great trip to, to Kenya and Sudan, um, where he really focused on humanitarian assistance. Um, so we have great hopes for, for what's to come and, and what we're going to be able to do, but I don't think we have any new priorities to share at this point. Great, and uh, next question. Take one over here and then we'll come to this side. Uh, right here. Thank you. Hi, good morning, great, uh, great panel. Uh, my name is Laura Darcy, I'm with, um, working with ADB in Papua New Guinea on trying to get some solar um, uh, farms put in on a power purchase uh, agreement, so PPP basis. And so, Gerhardt, your, your point about FX risk is, is uh, very relevant to what we're facing at the moment. But there's another risk that I'm very interested to know whether you uh, have any or are developing any products for, and that is the payment risk. So the off-taker in these cases is the utility. And as you know, in these countries, the utilities are you know, financially quite fragile. Um, there is no, the government's not willing to make any sort of sovereign guarantee. So we're looking to, to, to see what, what's been done in other countries to, to try to address um, payment risk in these cases. Great. And if the folks on this side want, want to raise their hand, they have questions, the mic can make its way over. All right. Go ahead, Gerhard. Mm -hmm. okay, this, I mean, I can easily talk about that and 
talk about that at length because it's one type of risk, risk that we capture through the DCA guarantee. So especially under Power Africa, uh, Obama's Power Africa initiative, we are doing more, uh, more um, uh, f you know, PPA through financing of, um, of projects like this. And we, uh, on the, you didn't ask about the currency thing, but we typically do try to find a local lender to support this. We don't have foreign currency risk. But on the payment risk, if we can't find the like, Ministry of Finance guarantee um, or sovereign guarantee on the off taker, then it's, it's a risk that we will cover as the US government. Um, it doesn't, we don't automatically just say, sure, we'll take Papua New Guinea's risk, but we, we'll do a full analysis, we'll provision accordingly, but it's exactly the type of arrangement we would get into. And I, I just also add, I, there are some existing, you know, other DFIs and product lines that address that risk. Uh, we've worked with the Africa Trade and Insurance Agency, for instance, to ensure um, not just public credit risk, but also private credit risks. And I think, you know, part of what this mechanism can hopefully do is, is you not necessarily fund everything itself, but be that sort of glue and grease that can point out that there's already existing uh, instruments in the market that you know, investors might not be aware of that can help address some of these things. The World Bank provides this kind of guarantee. And uh, the other way to mitigate that risk to some extent, because it is a huge risk under Power Africa, we face it in every single country, um, is really to build the capacity of uh, you know, the, uh, the distribution companies to show investors that they can actually manage uh, mm. the inflows of revenue, because that's usually one of the big, that's why everybody's asking for a guarantee, because they don't yeah. trust the management of the revenue that's coming in from the, from the uh, power. So I think that, that that's a really good way of trying to mitigate that risk. Great question, thank you. Let's see, we had some hands over here. Uh, hi, my name is Duncan Gromko. I work on uh, Climate Smart Agribusiness Investment. And uh, I used to work at a DFI, the, the IDB, on a blended finance product. So very interesting talk. Um, I want, my question is about the, the level of concessionality that you provide in blended finance and how do you choose the appropriate level. Um, especially my concern is that public money can be used to kind of su you know, subsidize private investment and maybe make private investment more profitable than it would have been otherwise. Um, so I, you know, I see this problem with subsidy and that you can also kind of distort private markets um, through blended finance. So my question is just how do you minimize the level of concessionality or ensure that the level of concessionality is appropriate? Thank you very much. It's a very important and hard question. <laughs> I think we get that question every day. Yeah. <laughs> Internally, right? I, I think mean, every development agency gets yeah, this question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I'm not going to pretend, right? I mean, this is not... Uh, it's not a science, <laughs> right? Um, I, I think the most important thing is to understand the sector that you're in, understand the partners that you're with, and understand the local context. Um, and really, this is what I mentioned about the need for knowledge management and for modeling and for really uh, giving donors some uh, checklists, some sort of structures that others have tried where they've addressed this uh, and try to learn from that and build on it is really key because I don't believe that this has really been solved. And it's a question that, that really still remains. I don't know, Gard, if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I haven't come across any scientific way of, of, of doing that. I would just venture to say that as little as possible to catalyze as much as possible. Obviously, you know, there's, there, there's a place where that crosses. Um, I would also say that in many cases, it's the perception of risk that holds people away, not the, not the actual risk. Um, most of the people that run pension funds across America couldn't find Nigeria on a map. That means Nigeria is a huge risk for them. Um, if they, and so, in fact, where do we all make money in the market? Because we know what we're doing, and the people that, uh, that don't stay away, and so that's the difference between Real risk and perception of risk is where the profit in the market is. Um, so what, uh, what this blended capital, to your question, can do in many cases is help capital become familiar with that sector, that market, whatever. And once it's familiar, the blending of capital won't be necessary anymore. And it's I, just yeah. there for a period of time. And I would just offer as well, I think, 
you know, and I know the folks on the stage would agree with this, having been part of transactions like these, but, you know, the collaboration and transparency between different types of partners and finding the same language is super important to sort of get to that point of putting as little in to get the most capital out, um, because it's really hard, because obviously everyone wants to do what's in their own economic self-interest. Uh, and I know that one of the other, there's a number of sort of parallel efforts happening around this topic around blended finance and Convergence and Tideline are doing some really interesting work here to support some of this, but conversations amongst the development agencies around how they can standardize and try to come up with a set of rules or guides for how they themselves can sort of manage this type of blending capital in a way that will mobilize, but is sort of efficient for them from a balance sheet perspective. Then, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was gonna add, uh, sorry, just a couple more things, because on the guarantee side, it's a very clear answer um, to that question, which is that first, uh, our guarantee is unfunded, so by definition, our partner is funding the loan that we're, uh, we are guaranteeing, so it's all their own capital. Um, it's always, almost always a 50-50 risk sharing agreement, so we have as much on the line as they do, so we're not taking 100% uh, or even the majority. Um, and then the third thing is that we charge fees. So. We know that if they're going to make the loan without us, they would they would not uh, they would not partner with us um, because we actually we charge fees. I would say they are slightly concessionary compared to other guarantors, but um, but it means that they would not make the loan without us. We are actually getting them over the hump of accepting this risk, and as you said, really hoping for a, a sort of some sort of demonstration once the perception of risk is taken away. Yeah, I, I like the perception arbitrage point, um, but I think it's important to to remember that you know the alternative usually to blended finance is pure grants, and pure grants can be very distortive to markets. You know, we've tried, we've done some work in Haiti, and that is a market that is wildly distorted by a surplus of free money yeah. sloshing around. Um, in Afghanistan, for instance, at the height of the surge, you know, there were certain provinces and districts where USAID or other donors were dumping basically the entire previous GDP of that province in a couple months in grants. And that created um, not only distortions of the market, but new power brokers, the opportunity um, for rent seeking. So I think blended finance is hopefully a step in a direction where it's saying there's a lot of things where you know, just a pure grant can be distortive and uncompetitive. Um, I also think into the, the point on knowledge management, that sort of honesty and, and transparency is very important. You know, sometimes successful companies um, and investors hide the subsidy part. Um, you know, they might have success with a blended finance instrument, but then they make it seem like it was purely commercial, or vice versa, they take something that could be commercial and make it seem like it desperately needs subsidy. And that creates distortions as well. Um, to pick a sector that we've done a lot of work in, mini grids, um, you know, you have people talking about mini grids in sub Saharan Africa as if they're fully commercial and can be private today, and people saying that they have to be fully philanthropic and given away. Um, and that takes, and, and that's creating um, distortions that make it possible for investors and entrepreneurs to be taken advantage of. So it's important to not get too far ahead of the hype and say, oh, this is fully private now, um, or conversely, you know, use, sort of game the system and, 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 and try and make this perfect case for subsidy. Are there, uh, we can have time for maybe another question or two if there's still some, we have some up front for our poor mic runner who's standing in the back. Uh, Keep your hand up so he knows where to come find you. Thank you. Hello, Hannah Apricot with Permaculture Magazine. I'm wondering if any of your groups are familiar with permaculture and working with any, um, in particular with local economic development and regenerative ag. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, perma you said permaculture, right? If, if there's any experience working with that and, and what that might look like, if so. I'm from Canada. I know permafrost. <laughs> 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 Permaculture, um, I don't, we're, we're not invested in, in any of that at the moment. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to search. Sound, I'm yeah, not sounds familiar. like a no. I'm not for familiar with anything. It, I'd love to find out. Okay, great. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you. It's a system looking at how to integrate, um, connect all the dots for sustainability, but really to take it further so that you're regenerating the soil, um, mm -hmm. producing more food Got with it. less inputs. A amazing success stories, especially in Africa. Okay, so, great. great. Sounds so, like a, to, should definitely follow up. You can all educate you. all of us. Let's go for this question here. Hi, um, my name's Alicia Phillips Mandeville. I'm from Interaction, which is a coalition of U American nonprofits that work all over the world. Um, and I'm 
curious to know, many of our member organizations are large um, organizations that have their own revenue stream and are increasingly developing ways of looking at the way they use their capital base through investments or other, other instruments. Um, and when I hear people talk about this, they typically think of investors as either people or companies. And so I'd just be curious to hear if you think differently about or see a space for nonprofit investors who are increasingly operating at scale and with great sophistication. Um, and if, if you see them already, I'd love to hear about it. If you don't see them already, I'd love to hear how you think about that evolving. Great. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely, we're, we're defining investors very broadly because of, of this trend, which I think is great, because a lot of nonprofits have amazing uh, expertise on the ground and know very intimately the needs of, of the beneficiaries that we're trying to reach. So I think the trend of, of using endowments and using some of their own capital to actually um, invest alongside of their programs is, is a very positive one, and, and we're very open to working with them, and, and we are talking to a few, a few large NGOs already, so that's, that's a really great point. Great. So I think we have time for this young, this gentleman right here has had his hand up, so we'll, we'll give you, as long as it's a really good, concise question, <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> I can try and be good, but I'm not sure I can be concise. <laughs> um, I'm with the Great African Food Company, which is a Tanzanian-based organization that works with smallholder farmers in communities where World Vision operates. And um, we've been looking into blended finance, but... Uh, the problem is most of what you're talking about involves an investment in capital with a low return and the blend brings the low return up to a higher return. Um, for us to serve communities that are very remote, it's not just about capital, it's about operating cost that is at a loss. So it's a business that's going to lose 10 to 20 percent every year forever and will never make a profit. However, if USAID went in, the alternative is to just deal with this community with donations. So it's a much more efficient way to get at a positive outcome, um, but it doesn't seem to be financeable with any of the types of products you're talking about. I'm wondering whether there's a way you can see to blend in this sort of uh, situation. Sure. So I think that um it's a great example, right, of the kind of things that we would love to be able to support through invest, right? Because what you, the problem that you're, you, you're articulating not only needs you know, some investors to come in and for some donor to provide a subsidy, but it actually really needs some creative solution around what a financial product might look like. And I think drawing on the expertise of others who maybe have some ideas um, or maybe have deployed similar solutions in other remote areas in other countries is really what we're looking for. So through this invest platform, we're not just looking to work with capital providers and help those capital providers make loans or make investments. We are looking for that knowledge and creation of solutions, kind of co-creation of solutions. So it's a really, really good, it's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, so would, would love to follow up. So let me just, so we can give everyone a little bit of time to make it to the next meeting. If the rest of you have done so kept the way have, you've been late for everything. So you're going to be on time for the next thing, I promise. So I just on that point, just to sort of, fi to sort of finalize this, uh, Agnes, you sort of, you pointed out all the people that, you know, folks in this room can come to with ideas. Like what kind of ideas are you looking for? What's, what's going to be most useful in the coming weeks and months to really make invest sort of crystallize in a way that will achieve some of the objectives you mentioned? Right, so just to summarize, we're looking at uh, the sectors that, we're, that USAID supports. We support multiple sectors, but the main sectors are really health, agriculture, education. Uh, we're looking for people who are looking to invest or have invested in those sectors in the countries where we are present. If you look to our website, you will see all our missions in all the countries where we work. So it's quite extensive. Uh, we're also looking for people who have innovative solutions that may apply to those countries but actually are not working there yet and are looking to connect with others through this platform that may be working in those countries and may be able to create partnerships to support those solutions. So once again, we're not just trying through this platform to simply give out more grants or catalyze more capital. We are really looking to connect people that may not be working together yet, but could potentially through this network connect and really have a much bigger impact um, in the sectors and the regions where we're working. So if you're an investor, if you have innovative solutions in those sectors, please uh, come see us and see if you're interested in becoming part of this network. And once again, 
please reach out to us. I'll leave a whole bunch of cards here. Take my card, and I promise I will put you in touch with the right people to uh, to connect and talk to. Thank you, and thank Great. you for this opportunity. Really, yeah. it's it's an amazing opportunity to talk to talk to a crowd of of potentially new and exciting partners. Yeah. So thank you all for the attention. Thanks to SoCat for having us, and please join me in giving the panelists a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.